you. Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion Apart from Plato, very few philosophers have written successfully in dialogue form. David Hume is the most impressive exception. His Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion is a masterpiece, both of philosophical argument and literary execution. Unlike Plato, who gave Socrates all the best lines, Hume shares the good arguments between the three main speakers, Demea, Cleanthes and Philo, though it is clear that his sympathies on the whole lie with the last of these. The effect is to draw the reader into the debate. The correct view isn't clearly labelled as such and must be discovered through the cut and thrust of the dialogue, a technique he borrowed from the Roman author Cicero. Hume didn't publish this work in his lifetime. He feared persecution from the religious authorities. However, he took great pains to make sure that it was published posthumously. The central topic of the book is the design argument for the existence of the Christian God. The design argument was the mainstay of advocates of natural religion, that is, those who based their religious beliefs on scientific evidence. Natural religion was usually contrasted with revelation. Revelation was the supposed proof of God's existence and attributes provided by the Gospels, with their accounts of miracles performed by Christ, and in particular, the resurrection. Hume had already mounted a sustained attack on the claims of revelation in his controversial essay Of Miracles, which appeared in his Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. In the dialogues, natural religion comes under fire, though in a more oblique way, since the arguments are given by fictional characters rather than in Hume's own voice. The characters. Although five characters are mentioned by name in the dialogues, the debate is all carried by the three main speakers, Cleanthes, Demea and Philo. The whole conversation is reported by Pamphilus to his friend Hermippus, but neither of them joins in the philosophical discussion. Each of these three main characters defends a recognisable position. Cleanthes believes in the design argument, the view that the apparent design in the universe proves the existence of God. He is, then, a defender of natural religion. Demea is a fideist. That is, he doesn't put his trust in reason, but makes a commitment to faith. Faith that God exists and that he has the attributes ascribed to him. Demea also believes that the so-called first cause argument provides conclusive proof of God's existence. Philo, whose arguments are, with one possible exception, the arguments that Hume himself would have been happy to use, is a mitigated sceptic. His principal role in the dialogues is to criticise the positions put forward by the other two main characters and thereby demonstrate that reason can reveal nothing significant about God's attributes. In particular, his critique of the design argument, or argument from design, and of the conclusions which can be drawn from it, is devastating. Nevertheless, he does state that he thinks it is obvious that God exists and that the important questions are about which attributes God has. Whether this was simply an ironic touch added by Hume to avoid the accusation of atheism is unclear. The design argument. Cleanthes puts forward the argument a posteriori, which is now better known as the design argument. A posteriori arguments are arguments from experience. This is the argument that we can prove the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, benevolent God by considering the natural world. If we look around us, we find that every aspect of the natural world bears the marks of apparent design. It all fits together like a machine. For instance, the human eye is brilliantly suited to seeing. The lens, cornea and retina seem to have been thought up by a superior intelligence, and the design and the construction of the eye is more skilful than anything made by human hands. The conclusion that Cleanthes draws from this sort of observation is that the natural world must have been designed by an intelligent creator. This creator must have had an intelligence in proportion to the magnitude and grandeur of his work, and so must have been God, as traditionally conceived. In other words, Cleanthes draws an analogy between nature and human artefacts, and on the basis of this, concludes not only that God exists, but that he is all-powerful, all-knowing, and benevolent. To lend further support to his argument, Cleanthes uses several memorable examples. If we were to hear a voice speaking intelligently in the dark, we would certainly and quite reasonably conclude that there was somebody there. 
the articulate voice in the dark would be sufficient evidence for this conclusion. The works of nature provide, according to Cleanthes, at least as much evidence for God's existence as would an articulate voice speaking in the dark prove the presence of a speaker. Another example Cleanthes uses is the vegetating library. Imagine books were living things which could reproduce like plants. If we discovered a book with its markings, that's its words arranged in a meaningful order, then we would treat this as conclusive proof of its having been written by an intelligent being. Even if books reproduce themselves, this wouldn't detract from the evidence they present that they contain the traces of thought. Similarly, Cleanthes alleges, we can read intelligence and design in the works of nature. Only a blind dogmatist would deny the evidence that nature provides for God's existence and attributes. Or so Cleanthes believes. However, much of the dialogues is taken up with Philo, and to a certain extent Timaea, attacking Cleanthes' arguments. Criticisms of the design argument. Weakness of analogy. One argument that Philo uses against the design argument is that it rests on a relatively weak analogy between the natural world, or parts of it, and human creations. Arguments from analogy rely on there being pronounced similarities between the two things being compared. If the similarities are relatively superficial, then any conclusion drawn on their basis will be weak and will require independent evidence or argument as support. If we examine a house, then it's quite reasonable to conclude from its structure that it has been designed by a builder or an architect. This is because we've had experience of similar effects, other buildings, being brought about by this sort of cause, i.e. being designed by a builder or an architect. So far, then, we're on firm ground when we use an argument from analogy. But when the entire universe is compared to something like a house, the dissimilarity between the things compared is so striking that any conclusions based on the alleged analogy between the two can be nothing more than guesswork. Yet Cleanthes treats just this sort of argument from analogy as conclusive evidence for God's existence and his attributes. Limitations on the conclusion The basic principle that underlies the design argument is that similar effects are produced by similar causes. Because the parts and whole of the natural world resemble a machine in some respects, it's reasonable then to conclude that they originate from the same sort of cause as does a machine, namely intelligent design. Yet if this principle is applied rigorously, as Philo points out, Cleanthes would be forced into an extreme form of anthropomorphism, that is, the tendency to attribute human characteristics to non-human things, in this case to God. For instance, traditional theology teaches that God is perfect. But if we take the analogy between divine and human designers seriously, we can't be justified in claiming that God is perfect, since human designers manifestly are not perfect. In which case, even if the design argument does prove the existence of a creator, it's spectacularly uninformative about his attributes. To take another example, traditional theology is monotheistic. However, most complicated large-scale human projects are achieved as a result of teams of designers and builders working together. If we make strict use of the analogy when trying to explain the creation of the universe, then we'll have to take seriously the suggestion that the universe was created by a team of gods. Alternative explanations. Philo also suggests several alternative explanations of the apparent order and design in the world. Some of these are deliberately far-fetched. His point is that if we scrutinise the evidence provided by the design argument, it can't rule out these alternatives. There is at least as much evidence for them as there is that the Christian God is the source of order and design in the universe. For instance, at one point Philo gets very close to suggesting a theory of evolution on the lines of natural selection. He conjectures that apparent design could have arisen from the fact that those animals not well adapted to the environment in which they find themselves simply die. Thus we should not be surprised to find animals well adapted to their surroundings. Another explanation that Philo toys with is that of a gigantic spider spinning the universe from its abdomen. His point is that order and apparent design don't necessarily stem from an intelligent brain. Spiders spin webs with order and design, yet they spin from their abdomens. The analogy between a spider 
and a creator of the universe may seem absurd, Philo agrees, but if there were a planet inhabited solely by spiders, then it would seem the most natural explanation of order, as natural as it seems to us that all apparent design stems from human-like thought. Evil. The most destructive criticism of the design argument is provided by the problem of evil. How could a benevolent God have designed a world in which there is so much suffering? Philo paints a picture of human life beset with pain. Cleanthes' response is that such pain might be the lesser of two evils. His claim is that the reason God designed a world with so much potential for pain and suffering built into it was that any alternative world would have been even worse. But as Philo insists, an omnipotent God could have created a better world, or at least that's how it seems to mere mortals. Philo identifies four principal causes of suffering, none of which seem necessary, but all of which are part of the human condition. First, we are so constituted that pain, as well as pleasure, is in some cases needed to stir us into action. We seem to have been designed so that, for instance, the discomfort of extreme thirst gives us a strong incentive to find some water, whereas Philo thinks we could have been driven purely by the desire for pleasure of varying degrees. Second, the world, including the human world, strictly follows what he calls general laws. These are the laws of physics. A direct result of this is that all sorts of calamities occur, earthquakes and so on. Yet surely a good and omnipotent God could intervene to stop such events. A few minor adjustments would have produced a much better world with far less suffering in it. But God chose not to intervene. Third, nature equips us with the bare minimum that we need to survive. This makes us vulnerable to the slightest fluctuation in our circumstances. Philo suggests that a benevolent parent like God would have provided more generously for us in such things as food and natural strength. Fourth, Philo points to the bad workmanship evident in the design of the universe, at least when it is seen from a human perspective. Thus we find that although rain is necessary to help plants grow and to give us something to drink, it frequently rains so hard that flooding results. This and many other design faults lead Philo to the conclusion that the creator of the universe must have been indifferent to human suffering. Certainly the design argument doesn't provide sufficient evidence to warrant a belief in a benevolent creator. Anything but. The first cause argument. Although most of the discussion in the dialogues focuses on the design argument, this is not the only alleged proof of God's existence and nature that's brought up. Timaea is an ardent defender of what he calls the simple and sublime argument a priori better known as the cosmological or first cause argument. This is the argument which begins with the assumption that anything that exists must have had a prior cause which explains its existence. If we trace the chain of effects and causes back in time, we must either keep on going back in what is known as an infinite regress, or else we will find an uncaused cause, one that necessarily exists. De Meyer thinks that the first option, an infinite regress, is absurd, and so concludes that the necessarily existing uncaused cause is the first cause of everything, and is God. Cleanthes' response includes the argument that if we're looking for a first cause of everything, we needn't go back further than to the universe itself. There's no need to postulate a cause preceding that. Or to put it another way, even if the first cause argument proves that there is a first cause, it doesn't prove that that cause is God, certainly not as traditionally conceived by Christians. Was Hume an atheist? I've already mentioned the difficulty of unravelling precisely what Hume believed about religion on the basis of the dialogues. Philo, despite being the character closest intellectually to Hume, isn't simply a mouthpiece for that philosopher. Many of Hume's contemporaries took it for granted that he was an atheist, and no doubt if the dialogues had been published during his lifetime, it would have been treated as conclusive proof of this. However, it's interesting that Hume was genuinely shocked when he met unashamed atheists in Paris in the 1760s, though his views might have changed by the end of his life. His official doctrine was mitigated scepticism, a moderate form of scepticism which takes nothing on trust but doesn't go to the absurdities of those sceptics who attempt to live as if nothing whatsoever could be taken for granted. Mitigated scepticism, applied to questions of religion, points in the direction of atheism but stop short of it. The mitigated sceptic wouldn't accept the design argument as proof of the Christian God's existence or attributes. But saying that there is insufficient reason on which to base a belief in God's existence is not the same as asserting that God 
definitely does not exist. You might well have considered atheism a dogmatic position, that is, one for which there is insufficient evidence. Perhaps, then, Hume really did believe, along with Philo, that the universe had some kind of intelligent creator. However, he certainly believed that human reason was insufficient to give us detailed knowledge of what that creator, if there was one, might be like. And Hume died without holding out any hope for an afterlife.